Uh, welcome to the Australian National University's Big Picture Series. My name is Sean Innes. I have the privilege of leading the university's Public Policy and Societal Impact Hub. Today, I am joining you from the beautiful lands of the Ngunnawal Ngambri people, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future, and extend those respects to the First Nations of all uh, the lands in Australia and beyond throughout the world. Uh, the Big Picture series is part of the 2020 ANU Crawford Leadership Forum. It is designed to stimulate ideas and discussion around the issues that will really define our world into the future. Today's event is focused on global public health and there can be no more important topic confronting the world right now. The pandemic that's sweeping through the world uh, has changed the way we live. It is something that uh, a, a year ago, for all the planning that some countries have done, has come as a bit of a shock. Almost every nation, rich and poor, has worked quickly to protect their people from the virus, but not all. Success has varied, as have the social and economic consequences. As we move forward, perhaps our biggest challenge is both in the prevention of future pandemics, but also more immediately, how the world distributes and manufactures an effective cure or vaccine should one be found. It's a challenge that I think the panel that we have today is well placed to talk about. Uh, our chair is the wonderful Lyndall Strasdens, Director of the Research School of Public Health, of Public Health at Population Health, rather, at the University. Uh, Lyndall is joined by Jane Philpott. Jane is former Minister of Health in Canada and will soon be taking up position as Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's University. Associate Professor Camelini Luge leads the Humanitarian Health Research Initiative at the ANU College of Health and Medicine. Camelina, Camelini has considerable first-hand experience of responding to pan pandemics from her time as a physician with a range of international organisations. Tiki Pangestu is professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in the National University of Singapore. Tiki is a former head of research policy and coordination at the WHO. And we also have Amanda Glassman, Executive Vice President and Senior Fellow, Centre for Global Development. Amanda has more than 25 years of experience working on health and social protection policy and programs in Latin America and elsewhere in the developing world. For those watching the broadcast today, I encourage you to su submit questions to our panel throughout the discussion using the Q&A function in your toolbar. I think that's enough for me, really keen to hear from the panel. So over to you, Lyndall. Oh, thank you, Sean. And I would first welcome and uh, echo and uh, our gratitude of uh, being able to conduct this uh, webinar on the lands of the Gambri and Gunnawal people and um, our gratitude to those people and to all First Nations people. And I'd also echo your, um, your admiration of this panel, which I share, and it really is an honour to be um, part of this process, talking with such fine minds and thinkers who have been grappling with these issues, not just now, but over decades. So thank you. Uh, you know, I think uh, you make a good point, Sean, that um, we are seeing a real patterning of how this pandemic is playing out across countries. And it's true that the countries most hit um, have, have so far been in the Americas and in Europe, but it's, it is, it's a, there's a long way to go yet. And the patterning that we're seeing, although affluence may have started this pandemic through travel, the patterning we're seeing is showing up different cracks and seams and fault lines. And um, I think here in this country, we can be proud of the response that we have had, 102 deaths so far. And one of the reactions of the Australian government who was um, 
goaded, I would say, by our public health community and here on our panel are one of the people who was integral to uh, the Australian government's response, Camelini, um, into shutting down uh, early and fast as a way of controlling the pandemic. And um, the recent analyses of this go hard, go early approach has shown that it has paid off in terms of its containment, but there's a long way to go yet. One of the things, however, that's showing up is that this pandemic is not simply about an infection. It's deeply, intimately connected to inequality in both how it starts, who gets it, and then who bears the consequences. Homelessness, domestic violence, the mistreatment of, of children and women, uh, the issues that have the acceleration of racism, all of which are showing the seams through which the pandemic is flowing and amplifying. What history shows and bears out is that pandemics, from the plague to the smallpox to COVID, are all, not only do they generate social and economic upheaval, but they amplify inequality, as does the response to them. And this is a challenge we need to learn from, to look for the clues, all the countries are different, but what could we learn from those countries who are doing this well? There are low rates in some states and countries like Australia, Taiwan, New Zealand, Kerala, in India, and their counterpoints, Brazil, Russia, the UK, the US. What could we learn about leadership? About how we think about responses, how we plan them, how we execute them, about the social systems and the stance that governments take towards their citizens. So in this panel today, we've got a series of questions. I will try and weave in uh, some of the questions that are coming up. Um, some have come to us before the webinar, but please feel free, um, anyone who's uh, on the webinar, to be uh, posting a question and we'll try and weave them in. And although my questions are directed to some panellists, I invite all panellists to um, uh, raise their hand and uh, chip in where they want to add their viewpoints because they have a depth that I think we've rarely seen um, brought together before. So I'll start with Jane Philpott, who's the former Canadian Health Minister, Dean of Faculty of Health Sciences and Director of the School of Medicine in Queen's University. And I, Jane, I would like to hear your views about how will this pandemic change the way global health challenges, this and others, are met for better, for worse, or for whom? Well, thank you so much, Lyndall, for the question. And thank you uh, to all those who have put this uh, webinar together. It's certainly a, a fascinating conversation. And I think that the context that you have set for the conversation around uh, inequality uh, as a, a a real determinant of where this uh, this pandemic continues to move. But in terms of your question about what the virus will do to the broader picture of global health, I think that's a fascinating place to start because we are increasingly hearing uh, concern expressed from uh, many communities, many countries about what this pandemic is going to do to the, the big pillars, the big concerns that we've always uh, uh, tried to prioritize in global health circles. And you think, of course, of, of HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria being the, the, the top three killers that, uh, that global efforts have traditionally tried to focus upon. But of course, chronic diseases as well has to fall into that. And I think one of the challenges that we've seen uh, in higher income countries, but it actually is, a, is affected around the world, is the the great COVID shift or the COVIDization of all spheres of health systems, uh, whether it be uh, clinical care or research, uh, COVID has, has led to a tremendous shift, which means that, that all of those resources, the energy, uh, the research, the uh, ability to scale uh, 
has been taken away from other areas. And there is going to be an extraordinary amount of collateral damage. Uh, we're already seeing indications of the excess mortality that's taking place in many other uh, parts of the system. And that's highly problematic and something that we need to be very mindful of. Certainly we're seeing a shift of resources uh, from the funding, global funding streams um, in the charitable sector, the foreign aid sector. Uh, there's a, a shifting of of money moving into COVID and, and or dropping off altogether, but also uh, shifting of research focus, shifting of course of what health, health systems are making available to people, where people being turned away uh, from healthcare facilities around the world if they're not there for purposes of assessment of COVID. Uh, and then starting even to see indications of how uh, supplies are being increasingly COVIDized. There was an interesting piece in The Lancet last week that talked about uh, laboratory uh, 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 techniques and, and the, the reagents and everything that is not only are all of the manufacturing facilities moving towards uh, supplying the COVID needs, but also actually repurposing testing kits that would have normally been used for te testing HIV or something else now starting to be be repurposed for their, for COVID. So this is going to take a lot of uh, a lot of work to get our heads around how we actually address this ongoing very dangerous pandemic. But don't take our eye off the ball on these uh, other extraordinary global health challenges that uh, people have been working on for a very long time. Thank you, Jane. And I I think what's become clear in this pandemic is that health without health there is um, nothing else and that that we could shut down everything An unimaginable shift in how we think about how societies function to respond to health and i think what you're saying is that health won't change won't go away once the pandemic um, is is controlled it, it sits there and it, it, to some extent, I think you're suggesting it may in fact be expanding. So Tiki, you're a professor of public policy. Um, you've had a long engagement with the World Health Organization. How do you think this pandemic and if you like the kind of um, the surfacing of so many um, pro other problems around health and, and social equality, how will that change governance and the systems, the health system and the cooperation between as well as within nations? Um, how, what, what do we need to learn about these connections between the pandemic, other health, inequality, um, global relations? Uh, okay, uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Linda, for this opportunity to, to participate in this forum. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me because I'm actually an uh, alumni of the ANU and uh, the great pleasure of actually receiving my degree from Sir John Crawford himself when he was uh, vice chancellor back in 1977. So particularly a uh, pleasure to be here today. Uh, in answer to your question, yes, I think definitely there will be changes in governance, uh, systems and cooperation. In the context of governance, if I take an example of Singapore, uh, the, the, the optimal responses has always involved multi-ministry task forces going across all the line ministries, not just health. So I think that's one lesson from many countries in the region. Um, I think systems must be able to, to, to react rapidly to any fires that might sort of come up in the future. And we've seen that that's already happening in, in places like, like Korea. So I think systems must be more uh, responsive as well as of course being robust. And uh, going back to what Jane just said, to make sure that other public health problems are not neglected. Okay, and um, just to add to, to, to what Jane said, uh, Singapore, you know, which has had a very good response to, to to, 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 to COVID is now dealing with, my, with, with what might be uh, one of the biggest dengue outbreaks, you know, because partly because of this uh, diversion of resources. Uh, I like what uh, Jane 
referred to as COVIDization of resources. So I think, you know, those other problems should not be neglected. Other infectious diseases, and my other worry is a reduction in childhood vaccination rates. I think that's another risk uh, of, uh, of a health system being COVIDized, the way uh, uh, Jane put it, as well, of course, as chronic diseases and also mental health and psychological problems post lockdowns. We are seeing that in all countries. So that's in the context of systems. In the context of cooperation, cooperation, that part of your question, I think what the world has witnessed during this pandemic is not so much an indictment of globalization, but I think a re and reaffirmation of, of interdependence among nations. So, you know, highlighting the need for collective commitment towards actions that uh, in the future will deal with it. And having work as part of the United Nations system, I still believe that that multilateralism in the long term is still the way to go despite its problems. The second part of your question is obviously the, the uh, very important one in the context of, of, of this sort of so-called new normal. I think equity issues are, are paramount. And I think the key to your question is how do we deal um, with sort of um, infections and in inequality. Uh, and basically that, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, and I think what we really need to uh, be cognizant of is, you know, how do you take care of the disadvantaged and the vulnerable segments of society the next time this happens? We've already mentioned this, you know, the poor, the homeless, the elderly, the women, the minorities, um, uh, migrant workers, for example, uh, Singapore has had to deal uh, with that problem in particular of, of migrant workers. And, and I think, you know, all these people that are not on the radar screen, uh, you, you ask the question is, you know, what, what, did, what do we need to learn and, and quickly and, and, and what can we do differently? I just have three sort of fairly specific uh, ideas on that score, uh, sort of disadvantage people who are left out. Uh, firstly, the idea of looking at emergency uh, cash programs as one immediate uh, response. Uh, secondly, the idea of identifying and, and registering these people for government safety net uh, programs. And, and finally, um, sort of the development sort of cash uh, transfer programs for the majority of these people who don't have bank accounts, okay? And this is where I would like to uh, allude to one of your earlier suggestions, where the private sector can make a particularly important role here. You know, when you say cash transfer for the unbanked, you're talking about innovations for uh, cash transfer. And this is where the private sector, those companies working in the area of FinTech, FinTech and uh, digital banking, huge amount of experience and innovation there that perhaps can be used in future to take care and reduce the inequality of this large group of vulnerable people that as we can see in many of the low and middle income countries have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. So uh, back to you, Lindell, I'll leave it at that and maybe add a few points uh, later on. Wonderful, thank you, Tiki. And um, you know, what I'm, what I'm hearing you say is that to some extent the capacity to work across government, but also to mobilize government you're exactly. talking about cash transfers, uh, welfare payments, safety nets. Right, right. All of that requires a strong government. Exactly. And a deep government and a government that is well, well developed and well connected to its community. Um, so that's an interesting observation um, uh, around the role of the state um, right. in, in, in its response, as well as the stance of the state in its response. Camelini, you are, I would probably say, a humanitarian health legend um, and working so deeply and closely with some of the toughest um, uh, humanitarian crises from Ebola, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, you have seen and worked with the suffering of these people and the marginalised and the poorest firsthand. What do you think? we could learn about controlling 
the spread of infection and inequality and um, how might we best do this? And I'll read out a question from one of our uh, participants who I think um, clearly resonates with your own insights. The question is, um, international support during the crisis based on my experience working in Sierra Leone, which was essentially beaten by, uh, through the Ebola crisis, which was essentially beaten by mobilizing national resources and local strategies to break the transmission change, changing behavior at the community level. Uh, flying in large numbers of international experts and resources into a handful of Western, uh, Af West African countries was a secondary success factor. Does the COVID-19 crisis also demonstrate the need to work more with local leaders to reduce unsafe behavior and break transmission chains? As everyone said, it's an honor to be on this panel and have the opportunity to discuss with colleagues such as this. And uh, thank you for that question. I love the question because <laughs> it's, uh, I think what, what I've learned over decades of doing this work is that communities are the ones who solve whatever problem you have. And that's true uh, for pandemics as much as anything else. And uh, in some ways, what's, what it, it's even clearer, you know, maternal mortality, perhaps you can, you know, you, but you, you, you don't make the connection so easily. And so we can continue attributing problems to this and that without saying it, it's there because the community is not empowered and engaged. Whereas when you've got an infectious disease that is passed from person to person, it's obvious that if the community is not leading the response, you'll not control the disease. And I've seen that. I've seen communities that have nothing, you know, no running water control diseases like Ebola because they work together and they, they knew what they had to do. At the same time, we've seen very developed countries struggling with, you know, the, the best uh, state-of-the-art health technology uh, because their communities are not engaged, they're not working as one. So I think what being involved in the West African Ebola outbreak made clear to me, just like the many Ebola outbreaks and infectious diseases outbreaks I'd worked on before is that unless communities understand their central role in control, unless their, their priorities and needs are integrated into the response, you will not get control. And that's something I think developed countries have had to learn. You know, developing countries know this, uh, whether they choose to, to respond that way or not, they know that their communities are what guides response. And I think, it, you know, many, many parts of the, the developed wealthy world has had to learn this um, in this pandemic. And those who learned quickly are the ones who succeeded. I just briefly want to go back to some of the discussion before about um, the COVIDization of response. And, you know, my first, Ebola outbreak I did many years ago, not because I had a particular interest in Ebola, but I, because I knew until we dealt with Ebola, we wouldn't be able to get kids treatment for malaria and pregnant women safe delivery. Uh, so, but what that did teach me is that you can either see it as one or the other, or you can look for synergies. And, you know, last year, we had the Declaration on Universal Health Coverage. If every person on this planet has access to essential healthcare, we don't have to discuss how we're gonna get the vaccine to them. We'll have the system that delivers it. If every mother can have safe delivery, we will have a health system that can cope with challenges like uh, COVID. So I think our role as public health people is to look for those synergies. Um, you know, we've had a focus on health security as a very vertical, um, vertical thing that you know you do you do your pre pre-development of your vaccine and it shit sits on a shelf till it's a problem for people that matter that's never gonna never gonna fix this problem whereas if we find places where investing will deliver for people's problems now we will automatically strengthen what uh, the way we respond to pandemics now and in the future 
I'll stop there. I can keep going. But well, I'll well, actually, I'd invite you to keep going just a little bit more, Camelini, because um, you know what I'm what I'm hearing you say is that this the community has the capability, but there's there is a but there, right? It's if there if if what are the circumstances that enable those communities to 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 um to to to, to lead? And what does that tell you about? the governments and, and the actual the whole social system and the whole social thinking um, that and the leaderships uh, in, in those countries that enable communities to take uh, take that role? You know, you, I think it's trust. Trust in that you, you have expectations of what your government, what your health system, your education system will deliver. And if that trust is there, you, you communities will engage. I, I think where it's challenging is where that trust has been eroded and you need to try and rebuild that trust within the time frame of a pandemic, um, which is what I've seen. And what amazes me is e even then you can, right? Communities that have had decades of civil war, if, if you engage with them in the right way, you know, um, yeah, I, I when I've worked on outbreaks, I have 19 year old young men who are literate, who, but who work with me as disinfection specialists, who, who, you know, truly believe that their role is to support their community and respond. And that's why I love that question. Those are the people that end pandemics. And it's, it's the same in developed countries, I think. Uh, and again, the good thing about infectious diseases is that we're as strong as our weakest link. Um, if, if we, as a majority, respond, but we neglect subpopulations. And, you know, Tiki brought up the example of uh, Singapore. Singapore had a strong response, but they had a particular subgroup that was neglected, that didn't have access to healthcare, didn't have access to welfare. So again, infectious diseases, that's their job. It's define the weaknesses, exploit them. And I, I again think if, you know, whether, whether you care or not about inequality, if pragmatically what you want is to solve an outbreak, you need to address those things. And as public health people, instead of, you know, going back to West Africa, I, I still find it, it wasn't solved because of a vaccine. True, towards the end we had a vaccine, but many of the trials couldn't continue because there were no cases, right? We dealt with it because communities you know, responded. They supported the response. They engaged. The trust was built with them and between them and response agencies. In a similar way, I think, you know, if you look at there's an Ebola outbreak that's been ongoing in DRC for more than a year. We have a vaccine. What we don't have is a community that trusts those who are delivering the vaccine. So vaccine is not the answer. Technology is not the answer. It's just a tool. It has to be built on a foundation of equitable access to healthcare and trust. I can't remember. I, just, I don't think I answered your second question. Uh, well, I think you've, 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 so thank you. I think that's a beautiful um, summary and it gives, I think, a, a great opportunity now to turn to Amanda. And uh, Amanda, who's the Executive Vice President and Senior Research Fellow for the Centre for Global Development, you've been watching this. Um, unfold in the Americas. Um, what are you seeing? What are you learning? What are you What are you thinking about as this is unfolding, and you're watching and monitoring it? Um, what do you think we need to learn? Do differently, uh, rather than wait for a vaccine to prevent the next pandemic or even prevent the next spike. Thanks. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be on this panel uh, and share this conversation with you. So I think when you compare across countries, we do have to take into account that the starting point is very different in, in so many different countries. It, it sounds so obvious. But when we look at the age structure in different countries, or we look at the prevalence of comorbidities across different countries, and we look at the different health system strengths, at baseline, even before we talk about a policy response, there's going to be a different uh, trajectory to the outbreak. So um, some colleagues of mine have been doing some work looking at this, 
Um, and it's, it's, it's the case that an infected person in Uganda is about half as likely to die from COVID compared to the United States, even if we assume that every case that needed, you know, even if we assume that 20% of cases are hospitalized or something like that, the age structure and the lack of presence of comorbidities is protective in that setting. So we are talking about really different kinds of outbreaks at baseline. And that's why when we look in the Americas, these are middle income countries with very high prevalence of comorbidities untreated. Uh, by the way, that's another sort of thing we've forgotten to do in global health is to focus on non-communicable disease that turns out to be the risk factor for this outbreak. Um, and you see that they have health systems, but those health systems are quite fragile and they exclude a number of marginalized groups. Um, so I think, you know, when we see that, uh, you know, one, one question is sort of the policy, the political response, and I'll talk about that in a second. But if we look at a country like Peru that really did try to do the right policies quickly, and yet they have a complete overwhelming of their health system, it's because of that at baseline, right? Um, that they have uh, a, fair, a, a slightly older age structure than a low-income country, and they have an enormous uh, quantity of untreated comorbidities. Um, and their health system is very weak. So uh, that's at baseline. I think the other issue that you're bringing up is so important, which is the inequality issue. Um, you know, in the United States and the UK, this is affecting African Americans or Black uh, uh, English people much more dramatically than um, other populations, prison populations, homeless populations, people with intellectual disabilities. There was a new study that's showing like autism increases your risk by this enormous amount. So it's clear that uh, inequality is a huge explainer of, of the kinds of morbidity and mortality that we see associated with the outbreak. I did want to take a moment to talk about the issue of, of leadership uh, in this space that you, that you raised early. You know, it's, it's no coincidence that uh, the authoritarian populace, or as Tiki uh, described them in a, a little pre-conversation to this panel, the reckless leaders um, that, that would like to think that this outbreak is not happening. In Brazil, we learned that they are no longer going to be reporting deaths from COVID-19. Imagine just pretending that a death has not existed at all. So th that's, that's, that's a, a huge problem. And we are seeing those very much more pronounced outbreaks uh, in the presence of that reckless leadership. The question of what, what should we do differently? I mean, I do think we do have to do what we can to um, work on medical countermeasures and to make sure that they are accessible to all. And I, I do hope that the, the global collaboratives that have been launched really will be able to influence allocation of those technologies. But as um, Kamalini is pointing out, uh, there are some underlying baseline conditions, things we can do right away, things we know how to do very well, um, that we should use aid to do anyhow. So things like water and sanitation, things like cash transfers, things like targeted protection of vulnerable groups. These are things we know how to do that we can finance easily and that you would like to see a much bigger effort. Um, I would say I don't think we're even close to the orders of magnitude necessary in terms of the financing of the response. This is a historic recession. Um, I think uh, I was at, in a previous panel, someone used the, the $375 billion in economic losses uh, per month. Uh, so almost any, pre you know, we're not spending enough to make this stop uh, and to save those expenses that are going out. We're still in our little global health uh, we would like an additional, you know, $1 billion and maybe we'll help solve the problem. So I hope that we get a bit more audacious and, um, and convey more accurately the order of magnitude of response that needs to happen through the health system and then in the social protection systems and welfare systems around that necessary to, to cope with what's happening right now. Thanks. So um, I've got some comments coming through, which I'd like to just Read to and to, to more, they're less questions, I think, than observations, and to some extent, I think, affirmations of some of the think points you've been making. So, let me just uh, read through them before we come to our final question. So, Ian writes, um, admits COVIDization, it, more attention and support is being paid to the health system strengthening overall. And is this an opportunity to use the diagonal approach? to ensure synergies for identified priority areas, such as connecting these different aspects of health. Um, 
to make sure that they are actually fully addressed. So that's his question. Um, I think you've really spoken to that, Amanda, by talking about how uh, this, the, the, the infection actually is, connects back into um, the other comorbidities, all of which are about how people live. And, and that's why they are so um, uh, bound to social circumstances and inequalities. Um, uh, Lee uh, talks about how in the Philippines, the frail health system was exposed and stretched and that the first casualties in those sorts of countries uh, were actually the healthcare workers themselves. Um, um, Dr. Clark then goes on to say, a good public health system depends on good governance and a well-coordinated co curative and preventative health system. And it, it is actually both, isn't it? And I think that's coming through quite clearly that it's not just strengthening the curative system. It's, it's fundamental that you have a strong preventative system. Um, and uh, thank you. And she wants to especially thank you, Kamali, <laughs> as um, you were one of her supervisors uh, for her PhD. Um, so some, some great comments. Um, uh, so let me just come back to our final question. And um, so some of the points that I'm hearing coming through uh, in your thinking is that um, there's a problem of the untreated comorbidity. That health is, health is not something you can pick out um, pathogen by pathogen or disease by disease, it's connected. Um, that universal access to healthcare is almost um, an almost an obvious need uh, in order to prevent a pandemic, yet one that's often not mentioned. Um, trust. A vaccine seems so simple, but how do you achieve trust? What do countries look like that have that trust and leaders? And this idea, Tiki, that you raise, it's a governments with the strong safety nets that can reach out and is connected to trust, um, who, can, who can see and hear their, their, their citizens and reach out and, and, and protect and care for them that seem to be doing the best. And finally, the idea of the reckless leader. Sigmund Freud once said that the sign of a healthy mind is one that can face reality no matter how hard. And what you're saying is that reckless leaders don't face reality. They disavow it, they hide the statistics, they select. They, they, they are less pragmatic. So these are some of the threads that I'm hearing coming through um, your your insights and your observations. So I'll come now to the last question and then we can have a Q&A with our audience. Um, and actually, Tiki, you, you kind of, um, you sort of, you, you jump the gun, but you, you can, you can um, maybe um, offer three different ideas or three more ideas. But my question is, what do you think we could do now? What would be your top of the pops, first picks, what we could do now before either the next spike or the next pandemic? to control this spread of infection and inequality? Um, and what do you think are the most urgent changes that we need to make? So I'll open that to all of you. I, I'd be happy to jump in because I've been uh, listening to this really terrific conversation and you've all raised such, such interesting points. I think one of the things that came out, I think it was with what Camelini was saying, was how this pandemic has really turned some of our assumptions on their head in terms of who has done well and who hasn't done well. And we would have liked to imagine somehow that, it, that the countries would all line up according to access to resources overall. And that, you know, the more resources you have, and I'm talking largely financial resources, that you should be able to beat this thing. And that, you know, if you have less, if you're a less resourced country that you're not gonna do so well, but that hasn't turned out to be the case at all. I mean, it just doesn't line up that neatly. And so that I think does allow us a chance to dig into the underlying causes that some of you um, have already commented on. 
And what I think, you know, Canada is a, a great example of that. Uh, we're a high income country. We haven't done very well. Uh, thousands of deaths uh, in, in this country and they, they're continuing apace and, and continuing uh, relatively flat numbers of, of new infections. We've flattened the curve, but we haven't uh, managed to tilt that curve downward. And I think what it's revealed to us is that it's not just the uh, the inequities that exist between countries, but the inequities within countries. And it's, it, it, I think in terms of what do we need to do urgently is we need to transition to an equity first lens. And Canada, I, I would say, has been uh, one of the examples of a country that did a fantastic job right out the gate on making sure that all of our acute care institutions were ready. And every hospital, they just turned things around so quickly, cleared out the beds, canceled all the electric surgery procedures. Everybody was waiting at the doors of the emergency department for the flooding of, of cases to arrive. And meanwhile, as all of this work was, was taking place to get ready, the virus was starting to spread in those those uh, pockets, they, they, they found, the virus found the crack of vulnerabilities in, in institutions, particularly long-term care facilities, in, in workplaces where there's overcrowding, in, in migrant workers, in the agricultural sector. And it caught everybody off guard because the first lens was not to say, where are those vulnerable populations and are they ready? And do the long-term care facilities and group homes and shelters have the personal protective equipment that they need? And have they been trained in inf infection prevention and control? And uh, we've been playing catch up ever since. And you know, starting to, to get a grip on it with, with uh, good, better and better testing and tracing protocols. But uh, uh, equity first, vulnerability, first has to be the lens of, of public policy leaders, regardless of the global assets of, uh, that a country has. And learning from, from best practices around the world, uh, those who have, have had that lens, you know, I, I'm not sure um, how strongly it's come out in our narrative so far, but you know, you, uh, we, we discussed in our preparation for this a little bit around uh, leadership that looks to community and community-based responses. And often, you know, I think as a, as a woman, I'm happy to say that, uh, that the countries that are, are led by women have done really well, um, perhaps because they have leaned into that community-based response as opposed to an individualistic response. And that's obviously an, an overgeneralization, but uh, we need to look to, to places uh, that have done well and find out what, what lens have they uh, used to design their response. And uh, the rest of us who haven't done so well are gonna to have to be good learners. Thanks, Jane. Now I'm just gonna weave in uh, before uh, I hand over to you, Tiki, a couple of the comments that are coming up or observations, um, because I think that they're, um, they're, they're well, they're, they're, they're um, asking us to think a little bit more. So um, I've got a, on the issue of trust um, that, you know, to some extent, particularly in countries like the US, the trust has been placed in the market. So what is, let's think a little bit more about what is that trust, what does that trust mean and what does it look like and what is it we need to trust and create trust between, so that's one point. The second was um, inequality is obviously an issue, um, but what about the, the issue of how the West and the East and that way of thinking about how West and East have handled the pandemic. So countries like Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Vietnam, Singapore and China, where inequality is there, but also how they've responded to the pandemic looks different. Um, what's your comment about that? So I'm throwing them into the mix and I'll hand over to you, uh, Tiki and Amanda and Carolini. Yeah, let me just make three quick points on what we can do now. The first point is building exactly on your last comment. What we need to do now is build social capital. And I think um, uh, it's already been alluded to that countries where the form of government is sort of maybe a little bit authoritarian, but importantly, where the population trusts the government, is compliant to following instructions and directives and places community before self. So that's number one build social capital. Secondly, I love uh, 
Kamalini's point about local knowledge, that we should make an attempt to systematize and disseminate local knowledge, which in many cases are, are sort of uh, just passed on from one generation to another. I'm reminded of the Ebola outbreak in Uganda back in the 80s, where by the time the government people got to those villages, the communities already put all the public health measures in place, you know, banning gatherings, banning funerals, isolating the elderly. So huge amount of local knowledge. So that's the second point. Can, can, we, can we systematize that so that it becomes part of the uh, public sector response? The third thing that I'd like to mention, which we haven't mentioned so far, and um, I think um, uh, um, reckless leaders tend to be selective. So my third point is go always back to science and evidence as your starting point for decision making. So I'll leave it at that, thanks. Lovely, okay, Amanda and Camelini. Great, thank you so much, Lyndall. So I think um, I really like uh, Jane's point. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's really telling that the first response of the global community was ventilators to this illness. Uh, it was ventilators, it was a hospital-based response. And of course, that's normal because that's where we saw the cases coming out of Wuhan. That's where we, where we saw people struggle. But it's probably the case that in any outbreak, um, the idea of starting with those vulnerable groups and, and also to think about public health as a part of the health system. One thing that I'm struck by is that we always think of public health as, oh, that's my CDC or that's my public health institute. And it's you know, under finance, down the road, no one goes, some epidemiologists are there. They didn't, you know, they just weren't able to even operate through the health service in an effective way. And I think we're seeing that in the UK as well with Public Health England. Um, you know, when I look at the US, honestly, I do say to myself, it's just the basics at large scale that we're missing, test, trace, isolate. Um, you know, all the evidence is there, all the capacity is there, all the money is there. But it's like we don't have the will to do that large scale test trace isolate across the entire country. Um, and, you know, I think eventually we'll get there, but we're learning by doing. I think in the, in the United States, people felt like infectious disease threats were over. Um, unlike in some of the Asian countries that had experienced SARS, that had experienced um, other kinds of infectious disease threats at scale. So there's some learning going on here and that learning has a cost, unfortunately, in human lives. Um, I think uh, the other thing I would say about the accessibility of medical countermeasures of vaccine or therapeutic, this is really, really important. I think there are two things that I would think about as we, as we see these candidates come down the pipeline. One idea that people are talking about is to produce and manufacture some of the promising vaccine candidates in countries with small populations. So even if there is what they call vaccine nationalism, which is where I vaccinate everybody in my own country first, if I'm Singapore, I st I'm still going to have a lot of doses left over to vaccinate high priority groups in other countries. So that's a strategy that we can use as a global health system to make sure that, that there's not as much of a trade off between vaccinating my own people and vaccinating people elsewhere in the world in a more equitable way. Um, I think the other issue that we still have to think about though that's much more upstream is sort of the raw materials that go into these vaccines. If we have 200 candidates at once, they're all out there in the market trying to get, there's a, apparently a glass shortage that we would need to fill the vaccine, you know, to deliver the vaccine. So there's a lot of sort of issues like that to solve to even get to the, to the equity of the distribution further down the line. So I'll stop there, but thank you so much. Um, I'm getting a lot of commentary around trust and there's two, two kind of themes emerging here and, and Cameline, this seems just so fitting that I can raise these before you have your turn to speak. But the idea, what I'm hearing is that there's this, there needs to be trust in government in some form, as well as a, as, as a government that has the capacity to have strong social safety nets and um, as willing to invest in universal health care, there is the, 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 the reciprocal trust back up um, to that government from people and citizens. So that's one, one theme that's coming through in your comments and also in the questions. But then there's this fascinating idea about what about trust in science? Because that, because not only is trust in government on the way down, 
particularly in uh, Western democracies, and so too, and perhaps by no coincidence, is the trust in science. And yet we're signaling that both those things are fundamental to dealing with pandemics, prevention, response, treatment, and inequality. So Camelini, I hand over to you. I think it's not, not complex, you know, it's complex maybe to achieve, but I really like the example of Kerala. So for the last five decades, every time you talk about public health sex stories, you talk about Kerala. What have they got? They have high female literacy, they have good health care. So despite India having, you know, challenges and looking like it's going to really suffer from this, we have the state of India led by a school teacher, female school teacher, health minister who has past outbreak experience with NIPA, who recognized, so I think maybe the West focused on ventilators, certainly not low resource settings that have done well. She said, my health system's not gonna cope, my community's not gonna cope. She shut her borders, but you know, she knew she was gonna have a whole lot of very poor migrant walkers crossing borders. So she set up, systems for quarantining them, tens of thousands of people. They got three meals a day, good living conditions, they were happy. Um, so again, it's not rocket science, but you build that trust by delivering for people. Why do you trust anybody you know, whether it's you know your colleagues or the, the postman or whatever, it's because you have, there has been an established relationship where if you do what is expected of you, they deliver for you. So I think it's the same with governments and we can learn a lot from the ones that have succeeded. And again, you know, you look at places, poor places like Kerala, where you, you, you have much more, you would think, challenges than say Canada. Let's compare to Canada, right? But if you have fundamental assumptions that people, all people have an equal right to health care, to education, Look, I think we're talking about, but, you know, we can say it's, too, it's not good to be poor or uneducated, but I think it's good to look at examples that have achieved, you know, have been able to progress against those sorts of things with relatively little resources. But, you know, I, I know Australia, I live in Australia, and I think our governments know that if you mess with Medicare, which is our system of universal health coverage, you'll lose the election. So whatever form of government you have, they, they do know that there are things people value. And we early on brought in a scheme where casual workers receive wages. And for the people I know who are casual workers, their, their supplement was higher than their previous wage. So they have every incentive to stay home if they were sick or, you know, get tested. I, I think I always learn from past experience. I think there's a lot we can learn and we can also learn from the places that made mistakes. So building trust, it's easy once you have it, it's quick to lose. And I also think we don't need to do more research. We have examples and we know how we build trust with each other and we know how good governments build trust. Thank you. Uh, we have four minutes to go and um, um, I'm just wondering whether there's any final points you would like to raise or make um, before we close. Something very quick for me. I, I just would like to emphasize, you know, what Lyndall, you mentioned, the importance of, of science, uh, you know, in this sort of uh, anti-science, science denial world that we live in. I'm reminded of what Yuval Harari said. We humans know more truths than any species on earth, and yet we believe the most false falsehoods. Leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, Amanda. I mean, just to end on a positive note, I would say that actually the it's been a we, I think we'll see a resurgence of interest in science and evidence um, that hopefully will build trust for the future. Although, you know, of course, what people are witnessing in real time is how data is used to understand where the outbreak is and what their levels of risk are. 
Um, that knowledge is evolving and has to be corrected and contested. Um, the fact that we've seen this enormous scientific production in the public domain so quickly, of course, there are problems with peer review and things like that, but that is really inspiring. And I think somebody, uh, I was on an, uh, another panel where someone was saying that we have like 20,000 new papers every month uh, coming out on COVID-19 and its effects. Uh, so the pace of clinical research and science is intense. Um, and pe people are demanding answers from both economic and health authorities about how this outbreak is going. So while I agree with you that we're certainly in a period of low trust and there has been a period of great skepticism about science and evidence and data, we're also in a period where that may, there, we may be in, at, the, at the front of a renaissance of that as, as people turn to experts to understand what they have to do um, and who to listen to. And I mean, I think it's quite interesting there was a poll in the United States actually that found that many people trust the World Health Organization, for example, as a source of data on what's happening. So, you know, so that's, that, and I bet a lot of people didn't even know that the WHO existed before that. So I say, uh, let's, let's uh, perhaps end with a positive note that uh, things might be getting better uh, in the, on the margin. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, so Camelini and Jane. Jane. Uh, well, thank you again to the organizers for this. And I think my closing remarks would maybe just build on what Amanda talked about uh, in terms of international institutions. And, you know, we've talked about trust in, in national leadership and trust in science. And I think one of the other areas that's at risk is trust in inter international uh, global uh, bodies like the World Health Organization and, the, and UN agencies, et cetera. And um, this is not a time for isolationism and, and protectionism. This is a time to, to continue to build uh, those, uh, the, those institutions that will allow us to, to work together collaboratively to, to continue to, to build trust and understanding amongst one another. And no, there's no question that those institutions have been put to the test and have been challenged by uh, some very powerful leaders. But uh, we, we can't deny uh, the, the linkages amongst ourselves and uh, we will not succeed without uh, looking out for the best interests of, of the uh, entire planet. And uh, so let's, uh, let's close on a note of positivity around the fact that, that we do. People have worked very hard for a very long time to build those institutions and, and I believe that they need our support rather than our uh, abandonment of them. Thank you, Jane. Kamalini. I think the two are connected. So trust comes from transparency and honesty. And again, you've seen that with the governments that were clear, you know, and, and individual leaders. I, I read an interview, one of our premiers, who was one of the first to shut down and somebody who had lost his business because of it said, I'm annoyed as a businessman, but as a hu human being, I'm going to vote for him, his party for the first time ever, because I'm proud of the fact that he prioritised our community and our well-being. So, and that was about, you know, acting on the information you have. And people are very, have been very capable, shown, the community has shown their capacity to shift as information shifts. If they are kept informed and they are told we're not sure where we are when we know we'll let you know but in the meantime here's what we think and I, I think it, it is about treating communities with respect acknowledging you know uncertainty uh, and, and that again it's about <laughs> so I'll stop there I think um, we know what we need to do which is the great thing <laughs> Well, um, what I'm hearing really, we're ending with this, with this connection between trust and science and human decency as well as human um, governance and systems and um, knowledge. And, and it is, this, it is these, these interplays between knowledge and, and, and qualities of character and values that seem to be so important to navigating the crisis we're in. Um, you know, uh, um, I just want to thank you for what I feel has been an extraordinary stepping through and into um, the insights of that you've all brought to this question of the global health challenge that COVID-19 has uh, brought forward and will continue. And I'd like to thank Sean 
and uh, the Crawford School uh, for hosting this program. Remind the readers, uh, listeners, sorry, um, that um, there are other panels um, that will be coming. Uh, this is not the only part, this is one of the many uh, under the Crawford Leadership Series. Um, and to thank you and honour you, uh, speakers, um, again, for your contributions.